fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and family and friends, I've got a good one for you today. Today I want to talk about a book called The Untethered Soul. It's a book that actually takes the view of spirituality and religion and, uh, and mental health from a very agnostic point of view. A view that is kind of outside of religion, outside of God, and trying to find things within yourselves. But I actually think that a lot of the things within that book can be seen from a Christian lens, a Christian point of view. And so that's what I want to argue today, and that we can glean some of these ideas and concepts, these meditative concepts from this book, and we can apply it to our Christian lives to help us overcome anxieties and stressors in our lives, or overcome sin even in our lives, and through this process of prayer and letting things go and giving it all to God. I think that there's kind of an overlap that can be uh, seen or actualized through understanding where um, being a Christian and this Untethered Soul book have some overlap. So the Untethered Soul, they argue that you need to go through this process of first Choosing a stressor in your life, something that is bothering you significantly. This might be a work stressor. You might say, well, I have all of these deadlines and I just don't have enough time to meet those deadlines. And so first you've identified objectively, this is a problem in my life and this is causing me stress. And it says the next step, once you've identified it objectively, is to permit the pain to come into your heart. Permit that pain to just sit there and to see it and to feel it for a while. Just to feel it come into your heart and just to be like, there it is. That is what is causing me distress. It says then the next step is to permit that pain to just go through and you let it go. You let go of that pain and you let it go um, and you give it away. You just say, that is no longer a part of me. I've seen it. I've let it go. And now I'm going to move on with my life. It says then you can go to the next stressor. You can identify it objectively, permit it to come into your heart, and then you can let it go. And I would like to argue in this lesson that through the Christian life and the biblical example is that you can actually identify an issue, recognize that issue, and then you pray to God and say, God, this is tormenting me. This is troubling me in my life. And I pray that I can just give it all to you and that you can just take away this pain from my life. You can take away this pain that, that is just tormenting me so much. And I pray that you can send the Holy Spirit to comfort me in this time. And to fill that void of pain and to let it go. One of the greatest parts of being a Christian is that we are separate from this world. We are, uh, uh, Jesus says, um, I believe, let me see here. Uh, it's, he tells us, he says, um, in John chapter 17, verse 16, it says, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So Jesus is telling us, we're not of this world. As the church, as the Christian church, we're not of this world. We are separate. We are distinct from this world. We are unique. We are peculiar people. We do not fit in the way that other people do. We are peculiar. We're outside of this world. And that is, um, in the book actually, it agrees with that significantly, the concept that you need to be separate from these pains of the world. You need to find um, spirituality through letting go of these physical things. And they say that is the way that you meet enlightenment. And as a Christian, that is the way. Our enlightenment is our relationship with God and separating ourselves from this world. And so how do we do this? How do we let these things go. I, I just mentioned we can do this through prayer, and we can also do it uh, through the sanctification process. And we can only be sanctified, made holy, or purified by the truth that is of the Father, the truth that is of God the Father, that is brought by Christ, and that which is assisted by the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells us, remember in John chapter 17, verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And then verse 17 is the key part I want to come back to, is it says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So how are we sanctified? How are we purified? How can we let these things go? It says it's by the truth of the Father. And Jesus taught us this. He taught us how to have a relationship with the truth of the Father. And that is why we need to continue to study our Bible. We can be sanctified by this truth. We can be sanctified by understanding and practicing and trying to live for Christ. Being a servant for Christ. When we get to the judgment day, it says, well done, thy good and faithful. What does it say? It says, thy good and faithful servant. 
We are a servant for Christ. We are one that desires him, desires to follow him, desires to make him happy. And so that is how we can be tethered to Christ. One of the first steps is to identify the truth of the Father and how to have a relationship with that truth. And one of the main questions that we should ask ourselves, ask ourselves now is why should we permit pain to come into our heart? Why should we allow this process to occur? Because if we don't permit it, we're simply denying it. And so what I want you to do is to think about this issue from the point of view of, of sin. For example, if you have an issue of stealing, you have an issue of you just desire to take those things, but you don't actually want to confront that problem. You just want to say, well, you know, it might be an issue, but I just don't want to think about it. I don't want to feel it. I'm just going to do it, but I'm, I'm not going to think about it. But this is saying, this book is arguing, you need to identify that stressor, identify that thing that's incorrect in your life. And you take that thing that's incorrect in your life and you say, this is the issue and now I'm going to let it go. Now I'm going to release it and I do not want to be a part of that. I don't want to identify with that. And that is what this part, uh, what part of this process is. And um, I would like to argue that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, it says, neither give place to the devil. We don't want to give place to the devil. We want to recognize, say, this is troubling in my life. This is, this whatever I'm doing here is giving place to the devil. For example, if, if, uh, if going to a certain place makes you more inclined to take part in a sin, don't take part in it. Don't go to that place. Avoid that thing completely. And so we need to recognize that thing, give it to Christ, avoid those things, um, desire those things that are godly. And then I also have a couple tricks and tips of how we can release these things. Uh, one, of the, one of the biggest tricks and things that I loved about this book was it says, uh, it, there's this concept of don't live to avoid pain. And I'm going to repeat that again. Don't live to avoid pain. Because the second that you say, for example, if I, I'm a speech therapist, and so if I say, and it, it just by, by merit of being a speech therapist, it's a pretty stressful job. It's a job that comes with a lot of stress because you have clients and you need to meet all their different needs. And uh, there's a certain degree of stress and responsibility um, to being a part of that job. But what if I said, I'm going to just quit that job because it's too stressful and I'm going to go to the next one. Do you know what I've done? I've now initiated a chain of, of hiding from, from, from pain, from stress, from stressors, anything that's troubling me, me in my life. And so once you've started that process, when does it end? Now I've, now I've gone to the next job and I said, oh, well, now this job also has some stressors. So now how do I get out of this? I got to quit that job. And then I go to the next one. Now I got to quit that job. And I believe that that's what it's talking about. In Revelation chapter 21, when it lists a list of people that are not going to make it to heaven, in one of those one of those titles of people that are not going to go to heaven, it says, are the fearful. A lot of people don't like to accept that. The fearful are not going to make it into heaven. They are not going to be one of the ones named that shall have their part um, in heaven. They are going to be the ones that will have their name and the, uh, they'll have their part in the, the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. We cannot be fearful. And I believe fearful is, is, is uh, describing somebody that lives for for their fears. They try to avoid their fears everywhere they go. And this is not to say that you can't have fears. I think there's a certain degree of healthy fear of saying, well, I, I can't, I don't want to touch that stove. It's too hot. But if you're just saying everything in your life is to avoid pain, to avoid stressors, to avoid anxiety, I think you've, your, your, your master is now fear. Your master is not God. I mean, can you imagine the apostles if, uh, when they were being persecuted with this early church and, um, and they just said, you know what? This is too scary. Now people are coming after me and they desire for my head and now I'm just going to give up. I mean, th where would the church be today if they weren't um, responsible and if they didn't conquer those fears and if God the Father truly was their master? So you need to accept that there will be pain. And one of my favorite verses, it's a verse that is very highly overquoted, is Psalms chapter 23, verse 4. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I just love that verse. It's just saying, I will walk through that pain. Um, and it says, did you notice it says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it doesn't say I have the option to go around that valley of the shadow of death. It says that I'm going through it. And what do you do? You have to learn how to cope 
with the with with that shadow of the valley of death. You have to to cope with those pains and anxiety that come with that. And so we need to have these coping methods. We need to have ways to overcome these stressors and to be outside of the world to overcome these physical things. First uh, John chapter five verse five. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. What a beautiful verse there. We need to be overcomers, and we are overcomers by believing that Jesus is the Son of God. That is one of the first steps that you can do in your, in your, in your path, in your race towards salvation. Um, another uh, big tip that I love from this book was don't investigate it. Don't investigate your pains. For example, if I'm stressed about work, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not going to say, maybe I'm stressed because my supervisor told me this. Uh, maybe, maybe my supervisor would be happier if I did it this way. And maybe I can um, try to do this. You know, there's not a lot of things that we're actually solving with our mental processes. When we come home after work and you're trying to co go through all those anxieties and all those stressors, and we try to use that as our coping method, that as our cure. But statistically, the book argues that they argue that there's a statistical um, nature of you can try to overcome those things, try to find solutions. But in, in reality, it's not usually effective. Our brain wasn't designed to be something that just thinks about all of our problems and fixes it when we're at home and outside of the problems. We're supposed to just go into problems and, 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 and let God direct us through those things. Okay, the next one is... Uh, Thinking too much about mental health is not helpful. <laughs> and so there's kind of this, this paradox of, I want you to think about mental health to help yourself, but I also, thinking too much about that thing, um, I guess it's more less of a paradox and more of an irony behind it, is that doing too much of it actually results in you focusing too much on it. And you're, you're, you're not giving it to Christ. You're not giving it to God. You haven't let it go. You haven't let it wash down the stream and watch it go away. Um, you haven't released it. And so that's one of the biggest parts is that we need to, once we've conquered those things, once we've let them go, allow yourself to take, the book calls it kind of a mental vacation. You, t you let those things go and you're just done with the world for a while. You're, you're in the spirit. Okay. The next one is, uh, this is actually a non-tethered soul book tip, um, and I believe, and this is just a Nathan tip, I guess, uh, or a biblical tip. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And I'm telling you, if you just start to rejoice in the Lord, where is your focus? Is your focus on your stress? No, when you're rejoicing, you're praising the Lord. Your emphasis in your heart is given to Christ. And once you've let those things go, do you know what comes in? All this love. I know uh, actually what I do in the morning time is I'll set two alarms. I set one at, uh, at 5.55 and then one at, at 6.10. So I give myself 15 minutes just to, to go through these mental processes and go through it and, and to let things go and to give it to Christ and to, and to pray to God about these things. And I might say, okay, this is stressing me out in my life and I'm going to let it go. I'm going to give it to Christ. God, you take it. Take that pain from me. I've let it go. And you wouldn't believe how relieving that is. You've just given it to Christ. It's gone. Now you go to the next thing. That's bothering me. I'm going to let it go. I've given it to Christ. Next thing, I've given it to God. And sometimes it takes me about 10 minutes into my 15 minutes of, of prayer and meditation with Christ or, um, and with God. I just uh, Sometimes it takes about 10 minutes to start to let these things go and to, to actually overcome a lot of that fleshly nature that's within us. And so part of that process is letting love fill those gaps. Once you've let the, those things go, there's a void. And that void is very quickly filled up with love. And you'll just find that once you've let them go, you'll just feel all this love in your heart. And, uh, and you can even try to supplement that process by rejoicing and praising the Lord. Okay. And so now what I want to do is I want to read from John chapter 17, verse 6, and then uh, through the rest of the chapter, because I think it has a beautiful relationship uh, with this, this book, The Untethered Soul, and how we need to be tethered to Christ. John chapter 17, verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou give, gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. So we, as Christians of the Church of Christ, as um, well, the Bible actually refers to several different titles um, 
for the, for the Church of Christ. There's the Church of Christ. There's the Church of God. There's the Church of the Firstborn. Um, these are appropriate titles, appropriate things that we should call ourselves. Um, so we as the Church of Christ, as Christians, um, have kept the word of the Father. The true church had attained vertical righteousness with God. So we have attained this this righteousness with God, and it's not it's it's far more significant and important to have this relationship with with God rather than with mankind. And so it's very very important. Verse seven. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. And have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine. So Jesus, in this chapter, he's praying for those who belong to the Father. Uh, and that's the church. We are the church, and we belong to the Father. And it says in verse 10, And all mine are thine, and thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. So by spreading the teachings of Jesus, Jesus is glorified in us and through us. It's very important to grasp that concept. Jesus is glorified by us spreading the gospel and loving him. He's glorified in us and through us. And I want to argue this through John chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. It's saying, God the Father and Jesus, they says, they're saying that we're going to make our abode with mankind, with those Christians, with those people who follow me. It says, we will make our abode with me, with him, with the, him, with the person. Um, a lot of people think it's only the Holy Spirit, but Jesus says, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So it sounds to me like we have all the Trinity within us. He's working in us and through us. And I'm not saying that we are God, but he's working in us and through us. It's a very important distinction because in Genesis chapter, I believe it's chapter 3, the devil gives, um, that, that was one of his main temptations. When he was telling them to take of this fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, he said that if you take of this, you guys will be as gods. That was the, the first temptation of them is to tempt them to say, if you take of this, you will be so knowledgeable. You'll know all things and you'll be as gods. We are not as gods when Christ and, and the God the Father and the Holy Spirit makes our, his abode with us. We are simply, um, he is simply working through us. And we are no longer of this world. We are no longer of this world. We are in the Spirit. We are working uh, fully for the Father. Verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So the Father and Jesus are one, and the church should be one. We need to be like-minded. We need to be one. Just like the Father and Jesus are one, the church, we need to be like-minded. We need to be steadfast. We need to be on the same page. So when we're in our church and there's an issue in the church, let us discuss those things. Let us come to single-mindedness. Let us determine um, and study the Bible to determine what really is the will of the Father, what really is the truth. And as we, uh, as we studied earlier and read earlier, it says that that truth of the Father, it sanctifies us, it purifies us, it cleanses us of this world. That is how we can be separate from this world. It's really a beautiful, beautiful thing. Verse 12, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now came, come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So Jesus, he desires us to have the love of Christ in us. He desires this love, and, and he lived it and breathed love. Jesus and God, God even says, uh, the Bible even mentions how God is love. And if we want to have love, we need to have God in us. And so the untethered soul, um, it, it, this book, it taught me that in order to feel this love, we need to first let it go. We need to first let it go. Then we'll have this void that is uh, that just sucks up love like a vacuum. And we'll just be so full of love when we've done these things, when we've given all to Christ. And what's all what's left is that love. Verse 14, I've given them thy word and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. 
even calls it. He says, us as Christians and I, we're not of this world. And this might seem like a crazy concept if you're listening to this lesson. Uh, for those on YouTube, you might be like, what do you mean you're not of this world? That's crazy talk. But all it's saying is, it's this concept that you've given all of your physical strife and anxieties to Christ. You've fully separated yourself from the pains of this world. And your focus is heaven bound. Um, I just learned the other day, um, somebody was teaching me um, kind of the concept of, I don't know if you've ever studied this, but it's it talks about the kingdom and how there's the heavenly kingdom up here. We'll just talk about there's heaven, the heavenly kingdom. And then there's also reference of the heavenly kingdom down to the church. And the church is also called the kingdom. This is the kingdom and this is the kingdom. Um, and one person, they said that the way to understand this is that the church is an extension of, of the heavenly kingdom. We're just an extension of that. We are not of this world. We are just an extension of this heavenly kingdom, of the heavenly church. And so that is, that's the best way that I can explain it. Um, I hope that makes sense for you guys. Verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so we read that verse earlier about how we need to be sanctified through the truth of the Father. Verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and him, or sorry, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. I want to reread that verse. I, I kind of butchered it a little bit. Let me reread that verse. Verse 21 of, chapter seven, of John chapter 17, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So God the Father and Jesus are one, and by the truth, the church, which is referring to, uh, which is referred to in that verse as they, may be one in God, and that's a, and in us in that case is God. Okay. And an, another kind of bonus verse for this is First Corinthians chapter six verse nineteen. It says, "What know ye not?" That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. So it's saying that our body, we are simply, we're a temple. We're a temple for God. We're a temple of the Holy Spirit, a temple for the, for the Holy Ghost. And so we need to treat our bodies as such. We need to not um, abuse our bodies. We need not, to, uh, in, in my opinion, um, this is personally why, I do not have any tattoos. I, I don't. I don't believe. I. I believe that I'm simply renting this body. This is uh, for Christ. And some people say. I've heard some people argue. They said, um, "Well, I have tattoos, but um, you know, it's a Bible verse, and uh, and I'm doing it to glorify God." And they have their argument, and I, I understand where they're coming from. Um, I can. I can kind of hear what they're saying there. But I personally, my perspective on this concept is that I'm simply renting this body, and. This is the almighty God, and I want to give full reverence to him and full authority to him. And unless he tells me <laughs> in a vision or dream to, to stamp a Bible verse on my arm, I don't personally want desire to put that there. If God really wanted me to have that verse, I, I might just wake up and he would have a Bible verse on my arm. And I don't think, uh, I don't think that's necessarily what God desires. But uh, some people, they, they make some pretty good arguments, but uh, I'll, I'll just leave that into the opinion category. So I hope you don't, uh, hope that you're not offended by that verse. Verse 22, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that, thou, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be, uh, be with me where I am, that they may be, behold, they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and I will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, 
and I in them. And so we see the final uh, product of us letting these things go. Um, and that, and that, that's, that's what's the main argument in this Untethered Soul book. They said, once you let those things go, you're just filled with this love. And I would like to say that with a Christian life, if you've given it to Christ and you're rejoicing in God the Father, we have that same experience. We have that experience of, of just intense love and, uh, and sanctification through that truth through the Father, as we learned earlier. And so kind of the main takeaways I want you to take from this is that God dwells in us and he can work through us. We are not gods, and that's a very important distinction. Um, God even says in another verse, he says, um, if there were any other gods, I don't know of them. And so it's very important that God never gives authority that there are other gods. He says, if there were any other gods, I don't know of them. There, and, and then he says, later in, that, in the next verse or two, he talks about how I am the only God. I am God. And there's, no, and there's none other before me or after me. I'm Alpha and Omega. I'm the first and last. Now I'm kind of mixing up some verses here. Uh, that was more of a Revelations chap, uh, verse there I was mixing in. But that's the whole concept, is that there's one true God. And there's many different verses that support that. And so we need to be... Uh, if anybody ever claims to be God or to be um, one of the gods or to have any sort of divinity in that so sort of sense, um, you need to reject that as heresy. And so the main concepts, once again, grab that thing, uh, picture that sin that's in your life. Allow yourself to think about it. But don't investigate it. Just say, that is the sin that is in my life. And feel the weight of that sin for a brief moment. Just feel it and say, I don't like that. I don't like that feeling. And then you say, um, and then if, if, if you're experiencing that, I want you to pray with me right now over the video. I want you to pray with me. I want you to close your eyes. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I pray that whatever is in my life or in, in whoever is listening to this lesson, I pray that you can release that thing from them. I pray that they can have a heart to, to get rid of that thing that's in their life and that they can fully let it go and fully give it to you, Lord, and pray that they can move on with their lives. And I pray if that, that sin or that thing ever comes back into their lives, I pray that they can go through this process again and give it back to you and to continue to fight for you and to desire to be a, a servant for Christ. And I pray that, um, that you can just fill them with your Holy Spirit, fill them and take care of them and comfort them and work through them and in them. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's all I have in the lesson. I pray that it was helpful for you. I never want to end any lesson without going over the plan of salvation, which is to hear, believe, repent of our sins, confess that Jesus Christ is the only God, and then be baptized. God bless.